Council. Just have a few things to say before I pass into the chair for the formal agenda for today's meeting. Uh, firstly, the formal legal standing of the meeting. This meeting is being held under local authority, police and crime panels, coronavirus, flexibility of local authority, police and crime panels meeting England and Wales Regulation 2020. To take account of these regulations, Bristol City Council has produced a set of virtual meeting procedurals and these are available on our website. This means that the decisions made by this board will have the same standing and validity as if they had been made at, meet at a meeting in person. Can I ask uh, members of the board to ensure that your sound is muted when you are not speaking, and after you have spoken, please remember to mute your sound again. If you have any questions during the meeting, please raise your hand so that the chair can see you that you wish to speak. Uh, are there any questions from members before we begin? So if not, I will hand over to the chair and to make introductions and move on to the formal agenda for the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name's uh, Dr. Alison Bolam. I am co-chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board, um, a GP in North Bristol and work at uh, Bristol North Somerset South Gloucestershire CCG. Um, I'm going to now just invite everybody in turn who is uh, on this call to unmute in turn and just uh, introduce themselves and their role. So I'll just start with you, Oliver, actually, because uh, please, Oliver Harrison, thank you. So as I said at the start of the meeting, my name is Oliver Harrison, I'm from Democratic Services, and I'm here to uh, take notice. Of thank you. Uh, and Cathy Capel. Hello, I'm Cathy Capel. I'm the Associate Director of Improvement and Innovation at University Hospitals Bristol and Western, and I'm re representing Robert Woolley, the Chief Executive. Thank you, Cathy. Uh, Christina Gray, please. Good afternoon, Christina Gray, Director of Public Health for Bristol. Thank you, and Claire Chapman, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Claire Chapman. I'm Associate Locality Director for South Bristol for Serona Care and Health, and I'm here representing Janet Rouse, Chief Executive this afternoon. Thank you. Um, and it's all changing in order. Sorry, Councillor Craig, please. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Councillor Asha Craig. I'm the Cabinet Lead with Responsibility for Communities, Equalities and Public Health. And I'm also the Vice Chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board. Thank you. Samita Hutchinson. Hello, good afternoon. It's Samita Hutchinson. I am a Commissioner on the Commission of Race Equality for Bristol. I'm also a non-executive director on two Southwest boards, acute, acute boards, which is RUH Bath and Gloucestershire Health and Care Services, which is a mental health and community health board. Thank you. Thank you. Dave Jarrett. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm David Jarrett. I'm the area director for Bristol and South Gloucestershire at the at BNSSG CCG. Thank you. Elaine Flint. Hello everyone, I'm Elaine Flint. I'm co-director of Wellspring Settlement uh, and I'm here as the representative for the voluntary and community sector in Bristol. Thank you. Uh, Helen Holland, please. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Helen Holland. I'm the co-chair with Alison of the Health and Wellbeing Board and the councillor with Cabinet Responsibility for Adult Social Care here in Bristol. Thank you. Uh, Hugh Evans. Good afternoon all, I'm Hugh Evans and I'm the Director of Adult Social Care in Bristol. Thank you, Jackie Jensen. Hello, uh, I'm Jackie Jensen, I'm the Executive Director for People in Bristol City Council. Thank you, uh, Jean Smith. You're on mute, Jean, thank you. Okay, let's come back to Jean in a minute. Uh, Mark Allen, please. Hi, Mark Allen from the public health team in Bristol um, and the support officer for the board. Okay, thank you. Sally Hogg. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sally Hogg, um, consultant in public health at Bristol City Council and responsible officer for the Health and Wellbeing Board. Okay, thank you. Let's go back to Jean Smith. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Apologies for earlier. My name is Jean Smith, and I'm the director of um, a charitable organisation, Nilari, based in the centre of the city. And um, I'm also the chair of the BME Mental Health Network, uh, with over 55 participants. Thank you. Tim Jones. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Tim Jones. I'm an epidemiologist and the health economist at NIHR Arc West, uh, which is linked to the University of Bristol and University Hospitals Bristol NHS Trust. Thank you. Tim Keane. Hello, I'm Tim Keane. I'm Associate Director of Strategy at North Bristol Trust and I'm here today to represent Andrea Young, our Chief Exec. Thank you. Vicky Marriott, please. Good afternoon. Yes, Vicky Marriott from Health Watch in Bristol. Thank you. I think I captured everybody there. If you were not asked to identify yourself, please do so now. The, 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 the list jumps around a little bit, but I think I got everybody there. Thank you. Uh, we've got uh, we've got Claire Chapman, as she said, substituting for Janet Rouse. So the only apology we have is Tim Poole from the Carers Forum. Forum. So if anybody's got any declarations of interest relevant to today's agenda, could they please, um, if they're pecuniary interest, please declare them. Okay, please let us know if that's the case. Uh, we, there's no public forum, we had no public items, either questions or statements. So we're going to move uh, directly to the minutes of the previous meeting, uh, which are on in your um, piece of paper that was shared in the, so we've got the meeting. So the last meeting, uh, I'm slightly thrown, sorry, I've just got the latest email, the last meeting held on the 22nd of January. Okay, does anybody have any clarifications or corrections to the minutes. We've got a, well, page five in your pack is the first page of the minutes. Page six, page seven, page eight, and now I haven't got page numbers. <laughs> Okay, going right through to the end of the minutes, which I've lost page number. So page 11. Okay, everybody, any comments? I'm just going to move to the, the chat bar. So do bear with me, everybody, because obviously we're quite a new uh, way of doing things. So I've got no chats, no comments in the chat. So I'm going to take the minutes as read. Thank you, everybody. And I'm going to hand over now to um, Christina Gray for the, um, the first main item on the agenda, which is uh, a COVID-19 update. So I will mute myself. If anybody wishes to make a comment or a question, then pop something in the chat box. I probably would find the easiest if that's all right. And I will, we will take um, them in, in order that they enter in the chat box. Okay, all right, Christina. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to share a, a short uh, slide um, a presentation with you. Um, the main focus is the um, local outbreak management plan, which all local authorities are required to publish by the 30th of June. So I'm going to give you an overview of a uh, little bit about where, the, where we are in Bristol in terms of numbers, um, and then an overview of the plan, what's going to be in it, and um, what will then follow. So. Okay, can everybody see that all right? Yeah, you can make it bigger on your screens if you need yes. to at the top. Okay, we can, we can see it, yeah. Good, okay. A, I have to do it this way. So this is a current slide of where we are. There's, there's two 
uh, pillars of testing. So what you're looking at here are the tests which have come through the NHS laboratories. Um, and what you can see here is that here is the peak. Um, and uh, this is where we are. The bottom line is, is Bristol. So the total numbers and total cases in Bristol since, uh, since the start of the pandemic uh, stands at uh, 722. Um, and we are seeing a very low um, instance. Um, we're still seeing cases, but very low numbers. Oh, that's not what we wanted. Sorry, I think I'm going to come off the, the I'm just while you're just sorting it out, Christina, I'm just going to say, I think when the screen is being shared like that, I can't see the chat box. So we'll wait till the end of Christina's presentation and, and then we'll take any questions and queries. Is that all right, Christina? Because I can't actually see yeah. that. Okay, I'm going to start again um, with it, so you won't be able to I'll take the headphones off, so I hope you can hear me all right. Um, but I'll, I'll start again because it's easier to, um, to do the presentation with the mouse. Okay, so um, the reason we need to have uh, these plans in place are because uh, the harms um, from the circumstances surrounding the pandemic are now equaling and, and, and in some senses um, outstripping the harms from the virus itself. But the virus is still with us, it's still among us. So uh, we need to move forward uh, in a very proportionate and careful way um, to get the economy back, to get people back to school, but um, managing um, the fact that the, the virus is, is still there and the outbreak management plans are the way that we're going to do this. So lo all local authorities must have an outbreak management plan in place by the end of June. So ours will be published next week and they will be the mechanism for anticipating, preventing and containing incidents and outbreaks in local areas. All the plans have to address seven key themes and I'll take you through those. And we have to be mindful that disease knows no borders. So we have to address multiple uh, geographies. So the geographies that I have informed the plan to date are that we're working uh, with local authorities across the southwest region. We're all working to a, a common uh, approach and a common language to make sure that we can align and uh, share and uh, develop mutual aid arrangements if that is required. Um, we've shared the plans, uh, the, th the five authorities within Avon and Somerset have chaired the plans with the local resilience forum chairs. So we have in place uh, the agreements for de-escalating and re-escalating um, those emergency planning arrangements should they be required. And we will work, we're working across our Healthier Together, Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire health system. We're already doing this, but it's, it's we are, um, recognising it within these plans, particularly in our work with care homes, infection prevention control, our approach to testing and outbreak management. So these are the seven themes. Now the seven themes actually break down into four broad areas. I'll start at the bottom. So engagement, communication and government. We will have two new boards. Uh, there is a Director of Public Health chaired um, Health Protection Committee. We met for the first time this week and that group has a scientific and technical oversight of the plan. And there will be a member-led, it'll be a mayoral-led board in our case, uh, chaired by Marvin and Asher, um, which has the responsibility to, to ensure that communication and engagement with the public are in place large piece around data, so making sure that we're linking our local to national, testing and contact tracing, and then all of the plans for people in place. So I'm going to take you through these four themes starting from the bottom. So the two new committees, the mayoral led um, engagement board, this will be building on all of the communication work that we're already doing in Bristol. So the uh, regular bulletins to stakeholders, um, the blogs, the social media, the um, 
engagement with radio, TV, um, but also a linking with all our um, engagement uh, groups with this board, um, with our race equality and COVID board, with the equality board, um, with all of the equality groups. And the health protection committee is the scientific and technical um, uh, function, as I mentioned. We have to have transparency and trust. None of this will work if we have low levels of public trust. If we have low levels of public trust, we will have low levels of engagement with the programme and we won't be able to contain and isolate uh, the, inst the instance and, and outbreaks that we see. This has got to be a shared endeavour and every single person and every single organisation has a part to play. So this is the Health Protection Committee. Uh, we have public health, we have analysts, senior analysts, we have the head of equality, we have emergency planning, uh, we have the CCG, Serona, um, adults uh, services, uh, education, um, and our universities. So the communication engagement has to, has to have visible and diverse leadership, and it's all about the public and community confidence and engagement. The board itself will be working through the networks that we already have. So this board, but also the, the, all the networks that this board is, is tapped into. So this is a data integration piece. You may have heard of the joint biosecurity system. The joint biosecurity system is the national system which triggers the national alert. So this week um, there was an announcement that we went from four to three. So we have a, a national alert system, COVID alert system, which is one to five. Uh, one is good and five is bad. Uh, we were at four, we were never at five. Five is when the um, NHS system and all systems are completely overwhelmed. So, so the country uh, status was only ever at four and we currently step back to three. Um, we're not involved in that, that's nationally announced. These two here are, are the, the systems that we are responsible for. So we receive in Bristol, in every Director of Public Health Department, we receive um, data and information from national and regional sources, which we interpret, it's our local antennae. So we can interrogate what we are seeing, we can ask questions back to the regional team and we can check if what we're seeing we're not happy with. We're also working with the NHS uh, Intelligence Hub. That's more about predicting and modelling and what, what is now being known as future casting. Above and beyond that, why this responsibility has come to local authorities is because what we have above and beyond anything else are local eyes and ears. So while these data systems are very important, actually, our local eyes and ears looking at what we are seeing, listening to what people are telling us, um, is going to be as important as um, all of these um, uh, sort of routine systems. And that's what the outbreak plans have to uh, develop. Our local antennae have to respond to and feed this big brain. So it needs to be an integrated intelligence function. Testing, tracing and isolating, or testing, tracing and containment are, is, the, is the key enabler at the heart of this system. And all elements of this have to work, have to be in place, have to be functioning for this to, to be effective. Testing identifies positive cases. Tracing identifies the possible onward transmission from that initial case. So with an R, a natural R of three, every individual case is likely to have three, two to three other people who will have been onwardly um, impacted. So that's what the contact tracers are looking for. These, the, the three other onward, possible onward transmissions. However, none of that um, is effective unless the people who are contacted isolate um, and we manage to contain the outbreak if, if it's an outbreak. And that means uh, those who are contacts isolating for 14 days, those who are positive uh, isolating for seven days. 
the testing that we're talking about is the swab test, the PCR test, it's the nose and throat test. And what it tells us is if someone is positive. Uh, what we need to have locally under the plan is testing which is agile enough to support outbreak management so we can deploy it very quickly if we need to and that it is accessible. The other test which many people are asking about is the antibody test. An antibody test is being rolled out to NHS staff and possibly to some social care staff. Um, the antibody test only tells you if uh, you have been exposed to the virus. We know very little actually about immunity. So um, the, the, te the antibody test currently doesn't ha hold a lot of clinical, um, it's, it's not very clinically significant, but it, it is help going to be helpful in us understanding immunity going forward. This is the contact tracing system. We haven't yet got the app. We're hoping we'll have an app possibly by September and that'd be extremely useful. At the moment, all positive results flow into the national contact tracing team. That's at level two and three, the national team of call handlers. They try and contact uh, the, the, the person who's positive. And um, if it's all straightforward, they deal with it. They follow up the contacts and they ask the contacts to self-isolate. If uh, the national team uh, discover that there's anything slightly more complex, so, for example, they might discover that they're talking to somebody with a learning disability or someone who lacks capacity, someone who is homeless or um, who's associated with an NHS setting or a care home or a school. Then that will be um, forwarded to the um, health protection team in that region and that becomes a level one um, situation. So when we get to level one, these more complex incidents and outbreaks, this is business as usual for us. That's probably the thing to uh, emphasize more than anything else. These are standard uh, operating procedures, uh, which are in place all of the time. Uh, it's just, we don't usually have an opportunity to talk about them. Um, the Public Health England Specialist Health Protection Team will receive the issue or outbreak. They will do a risk assessment and then immediately contact the Director of Public Health or Directors of Public Health in the areas uh, impacted. An outbreak control meeting is then convened with the appropriate stakeholders and a plan is put in place, uh, which includes further risk assessment, plans to isolate and contain, further testing, situation management and communication. So we are required specifically to have plans in place for care homes and schools. Uh, these are addressed. Uh, we're well ahead with these two areas in Bristol. Um, the care home work is part of a wider care home support package that we are um, mobilising along with NHS colleagues and other local authorities. We now have whole care home testing and in Bristol we have a joint adult social care and public health uh, wraparound uh, response. Schools work is being led in Bristol by our, our wonderful Director of Education, Alison Hurley. Um, she has regular briefings with the school leaders. Um, I and my team are supporting those. We contribute to the weekly bulletin. It's a dedicated inbox for schools to contact us with any queries or if they have possible cases. And there is a support and advice. Um, there is a standard operating procedure with Public Health England to respond to outbreaks in schools. Again, this is something that happens routinely. It's just that in, in this scenario, it's, it's happening more often and that is um, activated um, as required. Um, we're working with schools, uh, so special schools have different needs to primary schools, have different needs to secondary schools. So we're working with the different school settings to help them work through their issues. Um, outbreak plans for people, communities in place. Um, these have to be locally identified and when the plan is published you in Appendix uh, 3, uh, you'll find a framework um, which is a snapshot of how we are beginning to identify these. So this is, for example, our Black, Asian and ethnic minority communities are a high priority for us in Bristol. We have Bristol Prison. Um, we need to uh, identify our high risk uh, workplaces um, and we're already doing work with um, our homeless population. But that is a very large um, piece of work that we are will be drilling into as we go forward. 
And I think I started by saying, please see the plan as planning, not as a fixed plan. It's a process, not a thing. We have additional responsibilities. Local authority has additional responsibilities to have plans and processes in place to enable vulnerable people to isolate. So without the isolation, you don't have the containment. Um, and there will be a number of people due to either their social or welfare or economic reasons who will find it difficult or who will not wish to comply with an isolation um, request. And we need to have plans in place uh, to address that. And that will be uh, the public health team alongside uh, Public Health England uh, with our adult social care uh, benefits and uh, BCSE and others. Sorry, and I didn't manage to show you the slides with all the numbers, so uh, I'll, just, I'll just repeat the numbers again. Um, so since the start of the pandemic, Bristol has had 722 cases and we've had a total of 236 deaths that have been um, associated with COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. So as I said just before Christina was speaking, we we're going to invite people to uh, question or make comments. Um, I can't see any. Is is there any questions or queries? Would anybody like to? Um... No, the, the only thing I would like to say is, so we have now had the uh, management plan um, given a green light by the powers that, that be. Uh, I myself signed it off today. Um, I think it's extremely comprehensive and um, Christina has to be applauded for all of the hard work an effort that she put into um, producing that uh, document. Uh, what what um, is now going to happen is that um, uh, Tim Bob Borat, our director of policy, will be kind of leading on um, kind of managing and supporting uh, the work of the community, the engagement board. And so we're hoping that a meeting will be uh, convened relatively quickly um, as we had till the end of June to actually have our management plan um, in place. So um, I think what's really important is that we actually have all of the, um, all of our ducks in a row, particularly when it comes to uh, communication and engagement. I, I think um, uh, Bristol has been exceptional in terms of the way in which we've been continuously engaging and communicating uh, both with our partners and, and the city in relation to uh, uh, COVID. And so we're going to take that and take it to another level. Uh, and we're also looking at how we can potentially engage uh, people locally in uh, specific communities uh, um, because there is still a lot of concern and anxiety uh, from both BME communities uh, uh, and others, older people who uh, um, too much mixed messages and we need to make sure that uh, they're getting information from trusted sources as well. And so that's something that we're going to explore going forward. But um, yeah, thank you, Christina. Thanks, Sasha. So I've got Elaine Flint with her hand up and a question from Kathy Capel. And I, I think Jackie Jenkinson put her hand up, but maybe you put it down again. You can... No, it was my imagination. Elaine Flint and then uh, Cathy Capel. Uh, thanks, yeah. Uh, it's really, I suppose, the question about um, the ongoing community response. So obviously coming, representing voluntary sector, but um, also actually coming from um, Wellspring Settlement, where we're the, the um, community support hub for, for Lawrence Hill, and obviously have been doing a lot of support work during this um, period from, from early March. Um, just... It's, a, it's, it's around uh, people, uh, community organisations having to, if you like, move, move on and move back to their main job, um, uh, obviously being very influenced by what we've learnt during this period. And we've obviously come across a lot more vulnerable people we may not have been in touch with before. But, um, you know, we, we, we will be running down and sort of um, moving people back into their main roles rather than into the support role. Um, so the, the issue about outbreak, obviously, is when we're very concerned about uh, in terms of our capacity then to 
to re reinstate all those um, support activities that we have running at the moment and which we are sort of running down, um, um, we, will, we will have run down by the end of July. So it's just to feed that into the uh, thinking and awareness about, um, you know, sort of us being informed at very early stages of, of, of anything that's happening in our, within our communities and for us obviously we're working with you on that because um, we, we can't turn it around in on, on, on the pinheads, you know, so, so just to, just to be, be keen to work with you on that. Thanks, Elaine. Um, uh, there's, um, we, we need to have a, um, a, a community meeting. So I've had some early conversations with Penny about the capacity issue and what we do. Um, but I think we'll have um, a community infrastructure uh, meeting with Vosca and yourselves and others to look at in the wider piece what we've got and if we've got sufficient in place. Um, it is communication and engagement. And the engagement piece is going to be absolutely critical in terms of us getting deep into the community. So we absolutely need to look at that and make sure that it's sufficiently resourced. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Cathy Capel has a question. Yeah, thanks, Christina. Um, you um, stated uh, towards the beginning of the presentation that you thought the contact tracing app would be helpful. Um, I know it's political a bit, but um, it, that aside, I'm interested to know what difference that makes, particularly for a densely populated area such as Bristol, what, what you think it will bring above what we're doing now. Yeah, I don't think it will do everything. Um, but uh, we know that there's lots of, um, or, or there's evidence we've got asymptomatic transmission, particularly amongst young people. And it will be young people that will be more uh, confident and comfortable using an app. Um, they're very widely used elsewhere um, in Asia, in, in Germany. So I, I think it's not a one size fits all. But that's where personally I think it would it would certainly um, add a, a great deal to to what we're doing. Um, the uh, the other issue that's got to I think we've got to get over is um, they're using an 0300 number at the moment to contact people, and we need to publicise that because of course we don't we don't lift our phones now if we don't recognise the number because we think it's somebody cold calling. So. Um, I think that's just been realised in the last few days. We need to do a bit of everybody needs to get that number in their phones because you will only be contacted by that contact tracing number. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Do we do we have any more questions or um, or queries um, for Christina about this topic on the uh, COVID nineteen update? Doesn't look like it. Okay, that's, that's... I did just want to ask, I'm, I'm aware now I'm on this call, um, our acute trust colleagues, if you were interested in sending someone to the health protection committee, so with Serona, um, uh, Director of Nursing is uh, attending, so if you, you don't have to do that, I'm aware you're very busy, but if you would like to, both trusts, um, please just let me know. It's a technical and scientific uh, Christina, could I ask who's the representation from the CCG? I think you, you mentioned the CCG, but. Yes, we've got, we've invited uh, Lisa Manson. She didn't make the last one, but it's uh, Director of Nursing, Lisa, and Dave is invited as well. So we've got, yeah. But again, we're, we're very open to, um, if people feel that they would like to be engaged, um, just let them know. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to um, move on to the next item on the agenda then, if that's all right. And I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Tim Jones from the University of Bristol to speak about the impact of COVID-19 on uh, BME communities. Thank you, Tim. Great, hi everyone. I'll just try and share my screen. So can everyone see the slides? Yes, we can. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. I'm Tim Jones. Um, my uh, colleague Lou Barber sends her apologies. Um, she couldn't be here due to illness. Um, so I'm going to spend about ten minutes presenting some findings from our rapid review on the impact of COVID-19 on BAME communities. 
So um, since the numbers of COVID-19 deaths started to be registered and analysed, uh, striking early figures on COVID-19 deaths showed a highly disproportionate toll on those from BAME communities. We were seeing headline after headline in the news and inquiries started being made about the reasons behind the figures. What we did in a short period of time was look at the available evidence in studies, reviews and analysis that had been made public to date. Um, and we completed this report around mid-May. Uh, in order to do this, uh, an important step is to look at these groups separately, uh, as finding possible reasons can only be done in this way. So uh, this figure shows information from five different studies about the risk of death from COVID-19 uh, in BAME communities compared to white British people. The plain bars are adjusted for age and sex, and the striped bars are adjusted for other factors such as deprivation. Uh, the white British bar is set at one, um, and this means that a bar at four uh, represents four times the risk of death from COVID-19. Um, and it's, it's fairly clear that uh, BAME communities are at higher risk of death from COVID-19 than the white British population. Um, so we, we know there's higher mortality rates in BAME communities, um, but uh, why is this the case? Um, we, we need to look into the reasons behind this to uh, better understand how to develop policies that protect these communities. Uh, and you might not be too surprised to know uh, that when we looked at it, um, we found an intersection of several factors and, and not just one factor. Um, so uh, we show them here, there's uh, deprivation, housing, education, employment, financial hardship, health practices, geography, racism and discrimination, access to health services, migration effects, and genetic and biological factors. Uh, and you can see we've also left a few circles empty on this diagram. Um, because there may be other factors we're unaware of or don't have data on so far. Um, so I'm going to talk through a few of these in more detail, but um, you, you can read our report for, for more details. Uh, so risk of death from COVID-19 in England and Wales uh, increases with deprivation, uh, with uh, the risk in the most deprived areas being roughly double those in the least deprived. Uh, one study suggested uh, little of the risk associated with deprivation was explained by pre-existing disease or clinical risk factors, uh, so it must be due to other social factors. Ethnic minorities are more likely to live in overcrowded households uh, where there are more people in bedrooms and also in intergenerational households. Uh, this increases the virus transmission risk and makes self-isolation more difficult. Lower educational attainment or poor English skills may lead to low health literacy and understanding. Um, GCSE and A-level cancellations are likely to have a greater impact on children from poorer or ethnic minority backgrounds who are often predicted worse grades than they actually get. The nature of people's jobs is uh, likely to be an important factor for their risk of infection uh, and key workers face ongoing risks from contact with individuals who are contagious. Um, so the ONS showed people in low paid occupations have a higher risk of death from COVID-19 uh, amongst men uh, taxi drivers, bus and coach drivers, sales and retail assistants and security guards were all at higher risk. Uh, and men and women working in social care were also at higher risk. Um, many of these occupations are disproportionately drawn from minority ethnic groups. Um, one example is the uh, Black African group 
uh, where approximately a third of the working age population are employed in key worker roles, with one in five in health and social care jobs. Uh, loss of income has affected lots of households during the pandemic lockdown. Um, and this is, is especially true for BAME groups who are more likely to have low income, uh, be in zero hours contracts and non salary jobs than white ethnic groups. Um, this makes these people more likely to work in shut down areas or made unemployed. Um, signing up to furlough schemes can also have barriers such as navigating the system if English is not your first language. Uh, so comorbidities, uh, black and South Asian ethnic groups have been found to have much higher rates of diabetes than the general population uh, and older Pakistani men have higher levels of cardiovascular disease. Uh, older Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi and Black Caribbean people are more likely than white British people to report one or more health problems, which could increase their health risks. Uh, however, one of the studies we reviewed uh, suggested that only a small part of the substantially increased risks of death from COVID-19 amongst non-white groups can be attributed to existing disease. Um, there are large differences in smoking by ethnic group, or, although these also vary a lot between um, men and women within ethnic groups. Um, there are also differential levels of physical activity and obesity that could be a contributing factor. Um, urban areas have higher age standardized COVID-19 death rates than rural areas. Um, and BAME communities are, are, are more commonly living in uh, the urban areas. Racism and discrimination, uh, including the fear or expectation of it happening, uh, are widely experienced by minority ethnic people. Uh, and these have direct negative impacts on both mental and physical health. Uh, poorer access to health services and ethnic differences in uptake of preventative health care uh, can exacerbate health inequalities. Um, again, there can be barriers to accessing these services, uh, such as language, uh, particularly amongst migrants. Um, so uh, there is more uh, genetic variation within than between ethnic groups uh, and there's a widespread consensus amongst geneticists and epidemiologists that genetic factors contribute uh, only a little to ethnic inequalities in health. Uh, so some actions that we, we gathered from the studies we reviewed that uh, might help reduce uh, inequalities include uh, ensuring adequate income protection for those in low paid or precarious employment. Uh, and this is partly so workers can follow quarantine recommendations. Providing culturally and linguistically appropriate public health communications. Um, this should be developed with affect it affected communities and tailored to culturally specific challenges, uh, such as preventing transmission in overcrowded households. The removal of NHS charges uh, could ensure that no uh, migrant or individual from a BAME group delays seeking health care through fear of being charged for their care. Ethnic groups should be included in the health inequalities work with uh, senior leadership of, of the agenda. Data should be collected and reported by ethnicity to understand local needs and whether they are being met and take into account ethnic patterning and resi uh, residential income, educational and occupational profiles. Interventions should work with cultural and religious understanding while recognizing there's intergroup diversity uh, and avoiding stereotyping. And there should be a good representation of BAME communities in staff and leadership uh, and regular equity audits 
uh, across all areas there should be meaningful engagement and involvement of minority ethnic communities. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. That's, um, well, it's, it's very, very sobering, isn't it? I can speak as my colleagues who from the BAME communities were definitely noticeably more anxious and, you know, it is very striking in the health community. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Asha, you've taken, I, I'm sensing you want to speak because you've taken, you've unmuted yourself or is that, I think Asha would like to speak. Yes, I would actually. <laughs> um, obviously, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so this piece of work, um, you know, both myself and Marvin asked uh, Christina to, to actually um, uh, get this rapid review uh, happening um, very early on. So when we started hearing the headlines and saw what was happening, we didn't wait around for Public Health England, uh, who themselves uh, produced their report uh, a couple of weeks ago. Now, obviously, the policy recommendations that you have seen set out. Uh, so what we have done uh, since the, the, the report uh, came out, uh, we've done a presentation to a wider kind of uh, global UK audience in a piece of work that myself and the mayor are doing around tackling endemic discrimination. And uh, both uh, Tim and Lubaba did a presentation there. Uh, we also did a presentation to equalities um, groups uh, across the city. And as a result of this work, and in, in order to take forward not only just the policy recommendations, because they they're, they're, that, that that's coming from the report, but we've set setting up this COVID-19 uh, race equality group that will take forward, take action on those recommendations, and also uh, uh, additional actions that are coming out of some of the conversations that are being had uh, in, in different, uh, within the community. So I'm, I'm gonna maybe pass to Jean, but you know, Jean held a meeting yesterday, which I sat in, in on, and there are a number of specific, I think, key actions that um, uh, at which are going to require resources uh, because the other issue is that uh, uh, what was coming out of that is that, uh, as you heard, many people are, are really concerned uh, about what they're hearing. Uh, there are trust issues. There are issues around um, black young men who have been um, over, um, who are going through into the, as a result of COVID impacting on their mental health and then what's happening in the mental health system for them. So um, yeah, there's a lot of work that needs to be done and the community don't wanna hear us talking anymore. They want to actually see action there. They, they're just, so we have to make sure that uh, in everything that we're doing, we are demonstrating quite clearly that we are serious about addressing uh, this issue. Uh, but I'd like to thank um, Tim and Lubaba for this piece of work, because I think it's it's gone down really, really well with uh, other academics and um, other uh, key uh, stakeholders across the country. In fact, I, I've just been asked to sit on an independent inquiry up in Scotland because of the work that <laughs> because of the work that um, uh, we, we did on this rapid review, they want to kind of follow our lead, but they just don't have the infrastructure really in place. The commitment is there, but they want to know how to do it in, in, in Scotland. So the uh, actual Scottish Parliament has invited me to sit on, their, sit on that to help them out and help them along their way. So uh, Bristol is leading the way in lots of different ways. Uh, and this piece of work that we've done here uh, will um, is setting us in good stead, but we need to really start putting things into action. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That sounds excellent. Uh, the, the Scottish invitation. Fantastic. Uh, do we, does Jean want to come in? Jean Smith? You, you mentioned you wanted to hand to Jean. She'd had a meeting. Has Jean... Uh, have we still got Jean on the call? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, this, this whole Zoom world is, is challenging for me. Um, just to say, um, 
absolutely everything that Asha has said is is absolutely true. One of the things I do feel that was missed off um, with Asha's feedback is a lot of the anxieties were coming from frontline staff, so BME staff who were absolutely uh, that their anxiety levels were so high. Um, and one of the things they said is because information is just not coming down to them. So even frontline staff who are in hospitals were saying that the information just isn't coming down um, to them and they feel they're just beside themselves with fear. So lots going on, lots of work needs to be done and it does need to happen now. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. And I think Sumita may want to come in as well, and then, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next item. Thank you, Alison. And thank you, Tim and, and Asher and Jean for your comments. I, I think this is, um, I think we're at a certain moment, this has absolutely highlighted some of the real um, and stark inequalities in our city and in our nation. Um, and I think the, it's really good to hear about some of the longer term work that will come out of this. But I think I'm thinking more immediate and more short term so this question is more immediate and short term so for example we heard about education we're hearing about lower predicted grades for some of our, our our BAME pupils what can we do now I think what what's within our sphere of control as a health and well-being board and in terms of our other partners across the one city approach system and what can we do now to prevent to manage to tackle some of these inequalities and I wonder whether some kind of a action plan um, could be produced on the back of this, you know, qu quite quickly responding to this report. All right, thank you, Sumita. Who wants to, who wants to come well, in? We've already started a uh, kind yeah. of action planning. So we, um, the first meeting of the uh, group, we're just putting it all, all together, but we actually took away a lot of the feedback that came out of the meeting that we had with equalities groups. And we've actually started to group them. We are setting up different kind of COVID cell groups to take forward some of those recommendations. I know that uh, the race equality and education group uh, uh, will be um, are doing some work around the whole um, issue around kind of BME education. I know the mayor wants to put additional resources into ensuring that um, uh, young people are, are are being educated during the summer period because obviously there, there's been a, a lag for them during this period of time uh, but but um, the the aim is to ensure that all our boards are very much aware of what is happening and uh, they are taking appropriate actions themselves uh, to ensure that we take a kind of holistic approach uh, to this uh, health and well-being board will hold it um, on behalf of the rest of the city, but we need to make sure that our, our other boards and partners are taking this really, really seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Asha, and thank you, Sumita. Okay, D Dave, Jarrett, would you like to ask a question? Uh, thank you, I guess I, get that. I guess that was my question, actually. What, what further support do you need of the board um, in taking this work forward? Um, you know, what role would you, would you want us to play in this? I expect the board to be the champion of this work. And so we will be feeding. So the idea is that the, the COVID-19 uh, race equality board should directly feed into this group. So they will be, um, so we will be bringing back to you regular updates on what is happening uh, and you will kind of hold this because it, it, it is, um, I, I, I was on a call, the, a webinar with the LGA the other day um, uh, and I was really struck by some of the work that Birmingham is doing as well, and that their health and wellbeing board is really taking full and total control of this agenda. So I expect us to do the same. Thanks, Asha. Okay, I'm going to move us along now because I think this section of the meeting ends at uh, three thirty, and then we have perhaps we'll have a little break and then go into the the second uh, private section. Okay. So um, if that's all right, I'm going to invite Mark Allen to speak about the 2020-21 um, plan on a page. And if Mark could screen share that plan, that would be great. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, hi again, everyone. Um, so hopefully you can all see that um, this is the updated plan on a page. So this is for 2020-21. Uh, 
um, and it links very closely with the health and wellbeing strategy, uh, which uh, the board approved in January, uh, which set out the strategic direction of the board for the next five years. Um, and if you remember, a lot of the prioritization um, was based on a health needs highlight report that you also saw in January. So just to quickly um, kind of run you through what is on the plan on the page, um, it starts with our vision at the top, and then you have uh, the five statutory duties of the board in the five uh, blue boxes there. And then the six pillars. Uh, the first one are the three health and wellbeing ambitions that are in the One City Plan for 2020. Second one are some of the, the um, One City Plan ambitions which link to wider determinants of health. Um, and there's a, a fourth one there, which is about collaborating with the other one city thematic boards as we've, we've started to do. Um, the third pillar um, are some of the healthier together prevention um, priorities. And fourth one um, is to be updated. So in, in our next session, which is a development session, um, we were going to look at, um, uh, we were gonna have an item on the integrated care system. So I think we can flesh out um, that pillar uh, after July. Uh, the fifth pillar is um, some of the strategies that the board has a joint leadership role on. And finally, uh, the sixth pillar is um, some of the reports and uh, pieces of work for which the board has oversight and assurance. So I don't think there's ma masses that's very, very new on there. It was just updating it for, for this year. Um, so the recommendation is for the board to approve this plan, obviously pending the um, update to the care integrated care system pillar after our July meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay, so does anybody have any uh, queries or, or comments to, to Mark? Yeah. Can I? Yes, Can you I may. Comment? Yeah, I just, uh, well, to the board really, I, I think given that when we develop the strategy, because there's no reference in there to the fact that we've just got, gone through COVID. So I'm not sure whether or not this has been COVID proofed. And I think that's something that all of our, not only our board, but uh, we need to COVID proof and many of the policies and plans that we had in place uh, prior to this. And given the discussion we've just had on uh, BME communities, we need to be adding this into the the, the, the strategy going forward because that is going to that's quite that's important to our, our communities and um, it's not yeah it's not COVID proofed so I think we need to COVID proof it. Um, yeah, I think so. We when we had a discussion about this with, with the with the chairs, um, th there's a sort of whole load of COVID work that's going on elsewhere that obviously the board needs to be linked into, but it's kind of that idea that actually the board still needs to carry on with everything else that, that hasn't stopped in terms of health inequalities. Um, but yeah, happy to include any suggestions in there. Happy to make an addition, but it, it's it's just too blatantly missing <laughs> for me. So I, I agree with them, Asha, that we absolutely need to have in the work around BAME. Maybe even along the top as something that we're responsible for. Uh, can I just say one of the things that came out of a meeting I just had with our internal uh, refugee and asylum seekers staff group earlier was um, the fact that um, our JSNA um, has very limited information about refugee and asylum seeker communities. And I think just as we've done with women, we may have to do um, a specific chapter that looks at uh, BAME and um, uh, RAS communities as well, because it, it's kind of found wanting and we need that information as well. So just another additional piece of work. Sorry, Christina. <laughs> uh, I think Jackie Jackson wanted to come in. I think that I got it right that time, didn't I, Jackie? Hello. Good, but, um, I was about to see what Sally uh, said before me, so I agree with Sally. Okay, so a little refresh of the plan on a page. Yeah? Okay. Everybody had said what they want to say. Okay, right. All right, Mark? You picked up the, yes, the yes, thank you. information there. Thank you. Okay, 
So um, we're going into um, AOB now, and I do have um, a couple of items of AOB, um, which I'm going to just read out to you now. They're questions from the Connectivity Board. Um, so the, the questions interlink, so I'm going to say both of them, and then we'll, we'll think about our response. Um, this is asks from the Connectivity Board to the Health and Wellbeing Board. What are the plans and over what timescales to reopen the standard NHS services and what patient transport access is assumed? Brackets, very little public transport capacity at the moment. And then as a caveat, as an addition to that, how do we best promote active travel as part of improving people's health? So the first bit is, transport for people specifically attending standard NHS services, given the difficulties with public transport. And then in addition to that, how do we more generally promote active travel? So if we perhaps think about the access to NHS services, and I don't know if I can sort of pick on the trust. I mean, I know we have the buses, the hospital buses, Kathy, or it's Tim, isn't it? Your, your uh, UHB, can either of you comment about that? And then maybe, Christina can talk about the promotion of active travel or Sally. My, sorry to pick on you. <laughs> um, I, th I think our hospital bus is going to be running from, I think it is running from um, the train station up to the BRI site. Um, clearly its capacity will be severely diminished, but we are continuing that and also running through from um, the car park sites in town as well, where there's still free parking available for both staff and um, obviously patients can then access that. And the bus is up to South Mead Hospital, I'm assuming, as well, or you wouldn't know that. Yeah. We need to yeah. comment on that, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah so buses to South Mead, we don't run our own service like UHBW does, so um, there, is, there is community transport service uh, for, from some locations and it's the normal first buses that come to Southmead um, from other locations. Um, so there's obviously been a, a big reduction in the number of buses coming through Southmead but I understand they are running. Okay so you know so their question is what are the plans and over what timescales to reopen standard NHS services? Well we have reopened standard NHS services. We've got outpatients going on although of course they're more likely to be virtual uh, appointments where people won't require transport than they were in the past. So we just need to respond to these questions, I, I think, and where patient what access is as assumed, they write. What patient transport access is assumed? Alison, I'm just Alison. wondering if uh, the place to direct this is to um, the Silver Group, the BNNSSG Silver Group, so to um, to Sarah True Love, because um, there are there are quite extensive plans, as you know, in terms of the reopening of services. Um, I think it's Becca Dunn actually with, um, with with Deb, who has been overseeing that. So yeah, Dave, you probably cited on that this. Yeah. Uh, well, and uh, yes, um, so linked to that, um, Alison, it's probably uh, so. Sean True is chairing our is leading the kind of strategic comms cell that goes into Silver. Um, and she's she's been leading on a piece of work that's looking in public messaging about the opening of about the opening of services because because yes they are open but yes they will also be significantly different to pre pre COVID and yeah that kind of clarity of message needs to um, yeah need, needs to be made clear to our uh, community so um, so I suggest Shah and Alice, and I'll work with you on on that outside. Okay, so you and I will look at that offline. At that. Okay, for the NHS transport and then. Um, with regard to promoting active travel as, as part of improving... Sorry, the... Alison, just, just before we go on to active travel, can I just mention also, it's, it's Vicky from Healthwatch. I don't know how to wait and lose my hand, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm doing it physically. Um, the, we've been uh, letting people know that call us about um, the NHS responders scheme, which has a um, option for providing people with transport to appointments. And I think that's still active. So that's already worth also so sort of if, as Dave's saying, that those messages may well be going out, but um, that would be good to include that one. Okay. All right, Dave and I will 
take that as well and uh, feed it in or David. Alison, can can I just add though the point about particularly on the outpatients that it's um uh video or telephone consultation by default I think that's important yeah. to get across yes. Um, yes, I, because obviously that's limiting travel in um, and the number of people going through our, our buildings. So I'd like that to be emphasized, please. Yeah. Yes, yes, I, 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 I did. Make that. And that, no, we will. We are aware of that, fully aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. OK. All right. And then does anybody just want, I mean, how best we promote active travel as part of improving? In terms of active travel, there is lots going on and we will yeah. just prepare something. Um, that OK. Can I think what we'd, want, what we'd want to say on that is that in, our, in terms of our core public health programmes, um, both promoting activity and healthy eating remain absolutely core in terms of healthy people, healthy place. Um, and so Sally's leading that work and, and linking with our uh, transport leads as well, because it's about infrastructure as well as behaviour. Um, so yeah, it just uh, it, this remains a non-COVID high priority for us. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so does anybody else have any other items of any other business that they wish to bring to my attention now? Or we will we'll draw this meeting to a close. It's fifteen thirty-seven. Um, if we start, if we sort of log back in at, at five to four with an aim to start at four prompt and people can have a cup of tea, is that all right? Or is anybody going to argue with me on that one? No. OK. All right. So I think we have to leave this meeting because it's a new Zoom link for those of us that are continuing into the second part of the meeting. Thank you all very much. Thank you to the uh, external speakers, to Tim, thank you particularly, really.